everyone. Thank you all for joining us for our Reflections Town Hall, co-presented by the Berkeley Symphony and the Commonwealth Club. I'm Joseph Young, music director of the Berkeley Symphony. The Berkeley Symphony has a mission to spark curiosity or to provoke inquisitive minds. And the Commonwealth Club brings together audiences for discussions of public issues important to the community and our nation. It was only fitting that we came together to reflect on the arts during these times, unprecedented times. This reflection is intended to offer a platform for listening, learning, and engagement as our panel discusses how the arts and culture sector can be a catalyst for positive social change. As we are all dealing with this unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, once again, Black Americans are confronted with racist murders in the hands of our police. On May 25th, 2020, the death of George Floyd was not the first time we witnessed injustice. In fact, the inability to see the humanity of Black people dates back over 400 years. It's in the DNA of our country. To all of us, we've been here before. So what's new? What's the breaking news? For me, the breaking news is the global response. The breaking news is that we demand that we wait no longer for justice. The global response of hundreds of thousands of people, especially our young people, are demanding that we live up to the ideals that all men and women are created equal. The breaking news is we are all looking at the issue of injustice together, individuals, corporations, and we're all looking for opportunities to listen globally. In my 38 years, this is breaking news to me. It doesn't all look exactly the same. In the ways that we advocate, in the ways that we navigate around the issue, but we are all coming together in every aspect of our lives to look for real change in systemic racism. While I find the large number of white Americans, institutions and corporations standing with us in solidarity, a beautiful gesture, I'm always reminded, always reminded to remember that the fight for social justice is no sprint. The work institutions must do to, do, uh, to demolish centuries of systemic racism will still take years and even decades of individual and institutional reflection and action. But it starts with a reflection. As someone who is new to leading an arts organization, I'm honored that the Berkeley Symphony entrusted space and provided a platform for me and my fellow thought leaders to shape a dialogue from the authentic experiences, from artists to advocates to allies. And I feel I'm in a place to grow here as a young black leader and artist. So I'm so very honored to be here to be a part of this conversation. So I would love to introduce our panel. First, Jeff Benson, technologist, activist, executive director of the SWAG Foundation, Jeremy Geffen, executive and artistic director of Cal Performances, Deborah Gould, former assistant physician in chief at the Permanente Medical Group and board member of the Berkeley Symphony, Chip McNeil, director of diversity, equity, and community at the San Francisco Opera, Michael Morgan, music director of the Oakland Symphony, and Shark Yosefzai, board president of the Berkeley Symphony and co-CEO of Accordant Advisors. I want to thank you all for joining me. For everyone who is joining us on Zoom and on YouTube, we're here to stimulate conversations that you all can take with you on your, to your organizations. We are not here as a depository of knowledge, and we're not here as sole representatives of our race or our occupation. We are here to provide perspectives through our own experiences. As we move through this discussion, I encourage you all to ask questions. In the Q&A for our Zoom clients and in the chats 
and YouTube. And I hope to leave a few minutes at the end to answer a few of them. So let's begin. You know, my first question, my opening question is for everyone. 2020 has been exhausting and it's taking us on a real journey. With the recent killings, our nation is experiencing an uproar. These killings are not new. They have been going on for ages. So my question is, why do you think there is such a big reaction now from whites, blacks, and even arts organizations about police brutality? And I thought um, we can start first with Michael Morgan. Um, I actually think that the, um, the, the single upside of the COVID crisis is that everyone is at home and able to focus on what's going on in the world. Because as you said, none of this is new, but we've always been so busy that we could just sort of look away and keep going in our lives and just do what we were, just do what we were doing. And, and these young people who are out in the streets because we old people can't be out in the streets during the pandemic, uh, they are the real heroes now. They are really taking up the torch and going forward with uh, uh, with all of this. But I think it really is. Uh, I don't think it would be this way except for this pandemic. A blessing in disguise, right? Exactly. Uh, Deborah, what, what about uh, what, what? What would your answer be? Well, I'd like to add on to what uh, Michael just said. First of all, thank you for allowing me to join this panel. You know, during the civil rights movement, it was after the nation saw the images of um, water hoses and dogs being let loose on peaceful civil rights protesters in Birmingham. And after witnessing the police's brutal response to the march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge in Selma, there was a huge uh, wave of concern and issues that really forced the hand of some of our leaders regarding civil rights. We're in an age of cell phones and internet and, and, and uh, social media. So the revolution is being televised. People are really tuned in 24 seven, 365. And it's hard to believe that um, if, if you had, that someone wouldn't have some feeling of outrage and disgust watching a man plead for his life as he dies pinned under the knee of a police officer while his partners do nothing. You know, when we see these images over and over and over again, you know, any, any person of integrity reaches a boiling point. And I think the reaction we're seeing around the world is a result of this. You know, white people of consciousness are becoming woke to the pain of institutional racism and indifference that people of color have felt for over 400 years. And so the artistic expression is the outcome of passion and emotion. So it's fitting for art organizations to reflect and interpret artistically what the community they serve is feeling and to be a part of healing that pain. Thank you, Deborah. Um, Jeff, what yeah, you Thank say? you for the question, Joseph. And um, thank you for the invite to dialogue in this town hall this evening, um, distinguished guest. You know, I, I was born in the 60s and in Kansas, in Topeka, Kansas. My mother was a business owner. She was a beautician. Um, I remember once um, her telling a story of when um, she was the first African-American hired at a salon in Topeka, Kansas, and she was wearing an Afro at the time. They told her that she would have to cut her hair. And she said, my hair is clean and I will keep it the same way it is, end up getting the job. Um, but you know, my DNA goes back to, to that as placement, right, as centering. My father was an art professor at Kansas University. So really, each generation has its own movement and up, uprising. And we are at an inflection point, you know, as, as Deborah mentioned, um, in the society. And we are really witnessing something that's truly seismic. Um, in, in fact, that's really kind of driven from the lens of racism. So you know, this is not happening in a vacuum either. It's, it's part of this structural systemic ecosystem that we all exist in. And, and I think we're at a crossroads, a moment of reckoning for this country. So I think it's, it's really incumbent upon all of us in terms of social, political, um, systemic 
to really dig deep, right? And, and have a conversation with ourselves about what that means. You know, there's an eruption of consciousness that's occurring. And so again, this is all filtered through the lens of, of race. You know, I, I heard um, an analyst say the other day, it's, we're in a double pandemic right now. You know, the killing of George Floyd and uh, Breonna Taylor, those are modern day lynchings, Ahmaud Arbery, but, but let's not forget Emmett Till or George Stinney. You know, uh, there's a whole list of black and indigenous people of color that were victimized by racial terror lynching in this country. And we are, have been reawakened. And, and for, for a lot of us have triggered trauma in our very broken hearts, right? So, um, you know, I think Fannie Lou Hamer said it best once. She said, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired, right? So, um, you know, there's a pandemic. We're in an election year. There's an administration that's, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of leadership from the top. We're in a country that's very divided. There's a downturn in the economy and, and staggering job loss to, you know, to add to that. So, you know, these are all events that are uh, a culmination of, of what we're witnessing today. Yeah. Um, Chip, what, what would you say to this, uh, this question? Um, it's a big question. Uh, thank you again for having me here today. Um, I just want to recognize that as I come to this dialogue, um, living my life as a black man, as a gay black man, that um, I cannot always separate my emotions and my personal stake in this from the intellectual piece that I, I try to address my personal and my professional life. And so I just want to acknowledge the pain, the struggle and the sadness that I bring to this topic. As for your question, you know, it's inevitable that we would get to this point. Um, our collective pain has been just beneath the surface. It has been lurking there for some time and festering and growing. I feel like this modern movement has been really sparked by, and I wanna name Trayvon Martin, because that was where a catalyst began, where we began to see this incredible, absolutely crystal clear element of racial divide, of racism, and the pain. The pain has always been there, but remember, it's compounded. It's compounded grief upon grief, pain upon pain. We have environmental distress. We have social distress. We have political distress. We have an education system in shreds. Our system, our society is weakened by these pieces of disequilibrium that we're all negotiating. The wound has been opened. And I think this I don't know that we would be here if it wasn't for COVID. Because what happened with COVID-19 is that it used to be that we could always say, oh, we have this going on and look at the other. Oh, we're okay, but look at the other. And what happened was there was no other in COVID-19. We, we finally realized that we're all in it together and that we're all susceptible. It didn't matter how high and mighty you were. It didn't matter your political stance. We are all experiencing it. We are all impacted by it. And we've all been devastated by this event. And that was an awakening of the integral nature of things. The globalization of our society. We are all interconnected. Your freedom is my freedom. And your pain is my pain. And the realization of that, the crystallization of that has made it much more aware that the freedom we seek is the healing of everyone. Everyone is in pain and everyone wants to rise above it. But more importantly, and I wanna say this to the young people, we have youth who will not tolerate or accept the history they have inherited. They are standing up and they are being seen and they are making their voices heard in ways that we could never have imagined because they still have the, where, they have the wherewithal to imagine a world that's better than the one they inherited. And I am so grateful for that. Thank you so much, Chip. And, and yes, every, I think 
everyone needs to continue to realize that we're all in some type of pain and arts organizations are trying to you know navigate their ways around their own pain and navigate towards healing through their institutions and their organizations um jeremy do you have anything to add to to that well actually i, I first of all thank you for having me here but i i don't think i could say it more eloquently than it has already been said, it, except to add that um, th this is not it, Chip's comment about this uh, are all being in this together. We're all in it together on a global scale now. Uh, I, I can't recall an event in, in, in my lifetime in which everybody has been in the same place. And I think the the empathy that has come out of this moment is is proportional to the, to the the covid crisis um deborah you referred to um the kettle being on boil i i think that the temperature um, the burner was turned on the moment that we began to realize uh, what this pandemic was going to be and it didn't take much to to turn up the heat and uh, I think the lid has flown off the pot. Thank you. Shark, anything to add? So, uh, you know, uh, the questions that you pose, Joseph, uh, are very fundamental to understanding what the go forward plan is uh, for all of us as individuals, as institutions, and uh, as governments and the question that you asked first was, why is it different? This has been going on for 400 years. And secondly, what is the role uh, of arts organizations that in the past have kind of stood on the sideline with facile and empty statements of solidarity without much substance behind them? So I actually agree with a lot of thoughts that have been expressed. Uh, I think what we have, Jeff called it an inflection point. I call it a tipping point. Because if you think about Ahmad Arbery and Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, uh, what we have seen is technology coming together to see the brutality and not just systemic racism, but absolute murder committed before the eyes of the world by someone without the least amount of empathy uh, and aided and abetted by his cohorts in the event. But I, I do agree with Michael that in addition to the introspection and reflection that shelter in place and COVID-19 have uh, made it incumbent of all of us because this is an existential threat against humanity. If you really look at the disproportionate effect of COVID-19 on communities of color, it really brings forth this entire question of inequality and systemic racism. So just give you an idea, African-Americans make up 13% of the population of the US. The number of COVID-19 cases uh, and the percentage of African-Americans is almost 25%. And you add people of color, it's disproportionate. So that I think has started uh, to add a point to this period of reflection. In addition, I think uh, arts organizations are realizing that while the Jim Crow statues that are coming down that were erected as a revisionist of history across the South, the Woodrow Wilson School of International Public Affairs is now the Princeton School. The state of Mississippi no longer has the Confederate flag. These are very important first steps, but we must go beyond those. And the question that I'm always asked, uh, and I'm really happy to see the San Francisco Opera, Cal Performances, Commonwealth Club, and Berkeley Symphony join together in this discussion, is what do arts organizations have to do about this? We don't enact policy. We don't enact any kind of rules or regulation, but who are we? to comment on this. And I am reminded of a quote from Masterpiece Mixes, that, and I'll read it. It says, art influences society by changing opinions and translating experiences across space and time. 
research has shown that art affects the fundamental self, a sense of self, orchestras, opera, painting, sculpture, music, the performing arts and literature are the repository of a society's collective memory, past, present, and can profoundly shape the future. We have a role to play. We have a bully pulpit. We have a podium. And we must seize the day to end systemic racism in our country. Thank you so much, Shark. Um, you know, when, when I think of all those kind of ideas, I always want to come back to the art and why, you know, why I wanted to be on the podium. And I want to start, I want to ask my first question, my next question to Michael Morgan, because I'm honored that you are joining us today. You know, you, we hardly get two conductors in one room or one Zoom room. So I'm so happy that you could be a part of this conversation. And, you know, during times like this, I always think about how the vast majority of people who are leading these orchestras don't look like us. There are so many different factors as an industry we are navigating, but I don't want to dive into every one of those issues. But what you have done throughout your career has been remarkable. Um, and can you share, and almost it's almost personal for me, can you share more about how you navigated around this white space of orchestral music and became a leader of an organization while maintaining a sense of purpose in yourself and in your art? Uh, well, okay. I, the, the main thing, main advantage I had was in the way I was raised. I was raised to believe that I belong anywhere I think I belong. And if we can give that to the next generation, that's just the greatest gift you can give people to tell them you belong wherever it is you think you belong. And so, as I was saying in, in another discussion, I've always had this sort of bull in a china shop uh, approach to the thing where I'm getting in, I'm going to do what I do to the best of my ability to do it, which has obviously changed over the years. Uh, but, you know, I started out to be a conductor of orchestras. I didn't really think about the fact that there were hardly any other, uh, any other black conductors. I just, it was what I wanted to do. And then as I came along, I realized I had a special thing I could contribute uh, by accident of birth. That is to say, there are people who will listen to me talk about classical music who might not otherwise listen to someone who looked different from me. I can go places other people can't go and talk about uh, talk about classical music, talk about the, 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 my love of, of opera and, and musical theater and other forms. Um, and it, it, again, it was all in that, it, it's all in that background. If we can give the next generation just um, the ability to dream that they can do things, whether they see anyone else doing those things that, that look like them or not, uh, that's, uh, I mean, that's basically how I navigated the, the, the whole thing. Uh, you know, I'm old enough to have come through some, have been some places where, uh, you know, I've been the first black this or that lots of times, <laughs> in lots of places. But um, this has never seemed to me to be a burden. It's always seemed to me to be an opportunity to demonstrate uh, what could actually happen in the world, that you can actually have people who, and not just for, not just in conducting. I always talk about kids, talked about this with kids. It's not just about conducting. It's that you can have, people who simply do not look like their job. It is such an important thing to get across that people in all these positions can look all sorts of ways. And so if I can be a conductor, you know, you can be you know, basically whatever you, whatever you want to be. And that's, that's always been my approach. And I have, you know, there have been obstacles, but I really have come through it with almost no bitterness because I saw what my parents had gone through and my, and grandparents and, you know, I have nothing to complain about in comparison to what they went through. And so I need to just, I need to do my job and try to make it yet better for the next generation. Right. Thank you. You know, I, I don't want to dive into the story of how we met, but when you said that 
it, it was about, you know, you just wanted to be a conductor. And I think that was the same way for me. And I, you were actually the first person to see me conduct in a workshop. Um, and for me, as the first person to see me conduct or the first person to work with as a black man, I thought oh, this is normal, right? You know, and then going to uh, Baltimore and working with Marin Alsop, I said, you know, this is normal. It, it wasn't until, you know, you know, the pressures came bestowed on me that we started to understand this. But, you know, that curiosity of just do, being on that podium was the impetus of it. And I think when I teach, I teach now at Peabody and with the National Youth Orchestra and for them to keep dreaming and let us deal with everything that comes before that so they can freely you know be the musician be the artist that they want to be um and i try to make sure i instill that in everyone so anyway thank you for that you know dealing with arts organizations um for both of us we 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 do have to navigate around uh white spaces i like to call them and 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 my next question is for a jeremy guffin um you know, 80 to 85 percent of all decisions in the arts are still being made by white men. Lots of black artists are navigating around white spaces. And so my question is, how can white artistic leaders lead the efforts of their organizations as allies for communities of color? Well, I think that there are a lot of ways to, to approach that question. Um, if, if we're all, always speaking to the audience that we think we have, we have an ever diminishing audience. Um, the, the broader the story we can tell, the, um, the broader the audience we are speaking to. And seeing that, uh, while, um, well, it's very powerful to see someone on, uh, on stage reflecting yourself back to you, um, that there is someone who, who models for you that that, that is a place that, it, that accepts you. Um, I think it is incumbent on arts organizations to think broadly about the sorts of stories that they want to tell. One of the projects I was most proud of um, when I, I worked at Carnegie Hall was a festival of migrations and how uh, how they shaped um, what is commonly accepted as American culture. And one of the the three migrations that we focused on was the uh, the Great Migration and how that transformed um, American uh, the trajectory of American music. And I don't know if uh, it. it there is um, there's comfort in the known, um, but there is excitement in curiosity, and it's part of our, I think our role as arts administrators is getting people in touch with their excitement um, and and lighting that fire. Um, and one of the things that attracted me most to to Cal performances was the fact that there was this diversity of stories being told. And that um, that what was reflected on stage was a, a much broader, broader representation of the community that comprised the audience. There's always um, more work that we can do. Um, on the on the board level, it's important that we have uh, we have diversity so that the stories well. It, the themes, the advice that is being whispered in the, uh, the ear of the, uh, uh, of the administration is reflected of multiple cultures and not just a monoculture. Um, and we want to make our spaces more, uh, more inviting for audience members um, from wh wherever they hail. Uh, I think um, the record industry forced us to a degree to um, to classify our our loves. You know, you, when you go on Spotify, you type you type in what type of music you're looking for, and that's probably what introduces you to so something new. But that uh, that 
that system of classification really works against uh, curiosity as well because it, you're 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 handing yourself over to somebody else for for their opinion of what um, uh, what bluegrass music sounds like. Right? Um, so we we have to have empathy as arts leaders. We have to have curiosity, and we have to be willing to provide the sort of mentorship opportun opportunities that are few and far between and have become fewer and further between as the budgets of, of arts organizations have shrunk. And this is going to be a particularly critical time coming out of this crisis because uh, most performing arts institutions um, are su sufficiently weakened as a result. So we need to place an emphasis on allowing uh, people who, uh, who increase the diversity of, of, of thought within our institutions to have a platform. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I want to address my next question to Chip. Um, you, you have an, a very extensive background in education, consulting, activism, and you're an artist yourself. Um, and you've done a lot of work with arts integration for social justice with the Alameda County Office of Education. So I want to ask, how can arts organizations actively apply ideas of, of social justice and maximize their social impact? I'm asking this question because in the midst of this kind of situation, I find it kind of disturbing that organizations are making these symbolic gestures towards so social justice. And, and I want to know how do you think um, we can hold organizations accountable for their social impact? Thank you. Thank you for that, that question. Um, you know, I, I do come from an education background as well as an arts background. And I think that may be the very blend that we need right now. Um, uh, you're right. My work is at the intersection of arts, education, and social justice with a focus on transdisciplinarity, uh, educational equity, and, and racial equity in the arts. Um, and the, I think what we can do and what arts organizations need to do, what most organizations need to do is understand the process of learning and transformation. Listen, it's more than reading White Fragility. It's more than reading a book. It's more than having two conversations and it's more than a two hour training at the end of a board meeting one afternoon, okay? It's much deeper than that. That is not how you change minds and how you change hearts. It is the people who create the systems. It is the people who create the rules, the policies, the laws that are the structures that support and sustain racism and white supremacy. The way to change those systems is by changing the minds and hearts of the people who create them and sustain them. That has to happen through a deep integrated way of learning, a deep transformative process of coming to understand what you don't understand, of coming to see what you don't yet see. And the problem is it takes time, it takes money, it takes energy, and we haven't addressed it adequately. Simply as simple as that. Um, what we need, hopefully, like I said before, is the cognitive insight of an educator and the creative purview of an artist. Because together, we can look at this problem, this complex, wicked problem that is part of systems within systems of injustice that have been sustained over time. Guess what? It's not going to change in one minute. But what we need to do is, is, a, is approach this problem in, a, in the way you would go uh, engage in anything which is about transforming and becoming and enlightening. Uh, we have to teach for positive transformative growth. We have to meet, we have to think of, of, of a lot of our white brothers and sisters as learners and we have to meet them where they are. And there's a giant continuum of where they are. But the learning must be structured, it must be scaffolded. We must address not only this, this concept of fear and white fragility, but this, this other idea of a growth mindset, meaning you can change, you can be changed. There is something on the other side of this experience of dialogue, learning, and discussion. 
so there are absolutely things that organizations should and need to do. And that has to do with accountability. I'm so glad you brought that word up. And the first thing I'm going to say is money. Okay. Guess what? You can appoint the, the director of education. You can appoint the, you can have this, the team of the DEI team, and you can have the EDI task force, but guess what? It's more than a meeting. It's more than a couple of phone calls. It's more than one group discussion or even a company-wide discussion. The money you put towards your art, the money you put towards your galas, the money you put towards all the things you care about, guess what? This is one of those issues. Are you funding it? Are you putting the resources behind it? That's accountability, accountability measure number one. Are you funding the work or are you just putting something in place and hoping it takes off? Are you giving it the institutional backing and support that it needs? The second thing, accountability measure number two, as I would call it, is called you have to become an engaged learning organization. Now, people are using this term a lot, learning organization. And they think, once again, you read one book and I'm good to go. And no, it doesn't work like that. A learning organization means you have a learning plan. It is an ongoing plan. It is a sustainable plan. It has multiple ways in which you're taking information and approaching this problem, this complex issue. So becoming a learning organization is something that each organization is going to operationalize differently. The way the opera does it is different than the way the symphony needs to do it is differently than the way Cal Performances does it. But you have to operationalize that word. What does it mean to be an engaged learning organization? Critical learning. And as we approach this critical learning, I want to say something about that because I've seen a lot of material out there. I know everybody is like searching, right? Everybody's like, give me a toolkit. Give me a strategy. Give me a... And the thing is, that's great. But what you need to do is be very careful and vet those materials because what you need is something far deeper and far richer than most are offering. There are some good ones, but you need something far deeper than most are offering. The trainings that we're talking about, the engagement that we're talking about, the transformation that I'm referring to is multi-part. It's multimodal. It's multidimensional. And guess what? It takes more than a week or even a summer. It's going to take time. It's going to take time. And um, you've got to address all the key factors that we know that keep these structures of inequity in place. You've got to address racism, white privilege, white fragility, implicit bias, what it really means to understand the word allyship. You have to understand, in fact, more importantly, you have to understand, uh, someone else mentioned it early, the 400 years of struggle. This is not new. This is a, there were more rebellions and more uprisings than has ever been reported in your history books because they didn't tell that part of the story, right? The winner gets to write the history. So we didn't get to tell the part where we fought and resisted every step of the way. We have to make sure that as you're learning and becoming a learning organization, you're learning history. And that that history is embedded in a belief and a willingness to embrace the principles of social justice and human rights. Accountability measure number three. Listen, if every, every aspect of the organization must be involved, it can't happen with, with just a few white people at the top. It can't happen with the group of people of color who have taken on DEI. It has to happen in a way, in a far more integrated systemic way where everybody has a voice and where there's multiple ways of, of dialoguing and learning across and between cultures and all the different levels and places that we play in this game. Accountability number, number four, I call it transparency. How are you telling this story? How are you making it revealed? How are you engaging the public? How are you talking to your community? You can't, be do, you can't do all this work and not have a dialogue because the structures that you have in place have impacted people. So if you're trying to undo those structures, you also got to impact people and let them know what you're doing and how you're doing it and what it means. You're going to make mistakes. I just want to say this to everybody. We're all going to make mistakes. We're going to make, we're going to, we're going to have faux pas. We're going to, we're not going to get it perfect. We're in a crisis. We're in a double pandemic and we're in a crisis. 
And as we begin to learn and negotiate this crisis, we're going to make mistakes. Have the wherewithal to accept that. And don't let it throw you off your track. This is a, a, a time where we can come together and change things, but these measures about organizations taking this work seriously, integrating it, committing to it, funding it. Did I say funding it? Did I say funding? Did. I did say funding, okay. Funding it and being serious about what it means to learn about your whiteness, what it means to learn about my blackness, what it means to learn about what we can do together to heal this work, to heal this planet and to move forward in a way that has always been possible. Can I, I mean, uh, I, I have a follow-up question, I guess for everyone, because one of the things that uh, I am with accountability is, you know, we're going to make mistakes. And one of the things that I am seeing is everyone announcing that they've made a mistake. What is the right way for arts organizations to stand or something in solidarity, announce their mistakes, and to really look into their social impact wallet and sh see that it's pretty empty and uh, it's a negative balance, by the way. And the, uh, what 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 should an organization do with that? Yeah. Or it was just an open-ended for anyone. Uh, I would say one thing, I, I really don't need anyone to to tell me about their mistakes because I've seen those, uh, we, we've all lived through their mistakes. What are you going to do from this point forward? I don't really want, I don't, it doesn't really help me for you to tell me something that I can't fix without a time machine. Mm -hmm. So just tell me what it is you're going to do now and then we'll see if we think it's actually going to help anything. Thank you. You know, one of the big issues um, for every arts organization is, you know, about their community. And I want to start this question with Jeff, you know, based on your experiences, experiences as a community uh, advocate and disruptor, um, what are some creative methods that arts organizations can use to expand what I call their touch to their community? That's that's a really great, great question, Joseph. Um, you know, disruptor, huh? <laughs> I guess I have been called a uh, disruptor and definitely, um, you know, as a community activist, um, that includes that uh, as a moniker as well. I, I'm reminded of uh, marches in Selma that I've helped coordinate, um, you know, singing in Brown Chapel AME Church I've coordinated being told by the chief of police in Selma that we couldn't march across the Evan Pettus Bridge. And, you know, we disrupted that day and certainly uh, brought to bear an opportunity for us to engage the community there and make it about them and, and march across that bridge and make a statement, an impactful statement when it comes to music and the arts as well. Um, all, all the while singing, you know, while we're marching across the bridge um, and standing on the shoulders of our forefathers. My, my grandmother was one of the original 13 plaintiffs of Brown versus the Board of Education. My mother was one of the, she was a child plaintiff in that uh, landmark decision. So I'm a grandson and I've started a movement behind that. You know, my mom reached back and handed me the baton years and years ago and said, you know, keep black liberation in your, in your, uh, in your front uh, view mirror, son. Don't ever forget about where you came from. And they're very basics, um, you know, coming up with creative methods for arts organizations to utilize, to expand their touch, I think is great. But, you know, I hearken back to my experience of being a young black African-American male in the, in the Midwest and being bused uh, because of segregation to other schools. But that didn't stop my mother from enrolling me in music, music and art camps. You know, in the summer, she would put me back on those same buses and take me to Kansas University to the Midwestern Music and Art Camp, I'll never forget or was fully integrated. And not only were they, you know, academically putting books in our hands, but at the same time, they were saying, learn how to play this instrument, go over there and uh, figure out what the scales are on that piano, right? And that's really kind of shaped who I am today. So it's not just about singing in black churches, but it's about 
you know, augmenting that as an approach and not forgetting those stories, right? Um, you know, kind of getting back to the question, arts organizations, you know, I, I'm the executive director for a small nonprofit, and we have to use our collective energy and our connective tissue with other small nonprofits our size in a 501c3 setting and figure out uh, maybe because we didn't meet a threshold for funding, for example, how we can actually maximize that uh, with other small nonprofits, right? So, you know, art and culture make considerable and necessary contributions, obviously, um, to the well being of communities. Uh, I've lived in Oakland, lived in San Francisco, um, and so I've seen, you know, both ends of the spectrum in terms of economic and scale. You know, there are means to uh, us continuing the public dialogue around what those contributions should look like, what they should mean. Um, some of the paradigms that resonate with me are accessibility, um, inclusivity, equity, you know, driving towards certain outcomes and using data that's already there, right, uh, to figure out what that equitable development really looks like and how we can share the support in arts and, and culture to make sure that the, those communities that are, are marginalized and oppressed and often overlooked are centered in the arts and the culture and that equitable development. And, and it keeps them engaged as well. Um, I remember a, an event I was at in, in Denver some years back where uh, we, were, we, were, we kind of took over the city. It was a, choral, a massive choral event. It was a quadrennial event where, you know, five or 6,000 singers show up um, and we kind of take over the city for like a week. But I remember walking downtown Main Street and someone had, uh, donated old upright pianos and they placed them at each intersection and at each one of those panels there was a easel for drawing and we've just walked and we spent our evenings you know uh, conversing and walking up and down the main street but one of the things I took from that is that that piano as a tool and that easel brought the community together there was one time when there was a uh, a challenged person uh, from a a homeless perspective that was playing classical piano. And it just made me uh, stop and wonder, where did he learn that skill? How is he trying to move forward with this and tell his story and say, don't forget about me, but continue to make me a part of this conversation. Um, you know, we're, we fight public sector investments that combine arts and cultural assets as well. Um, some of us can't afford to really build in a way that's thriving, but we can be inclusive of certain economies and certain scale and certain local uh, municipalities that allow for our voices to be heard when it comes to making the policy and supporting that interconnected growth of arts and culture and the equitable development. Um, you know, one of the things that my small nonprofit does is we work with the homeless and we work with shelters, and we do a lot for education, um, and they're the ones that are hurting right now. So that funding is viably important, but at the same time, in order for us to be able to expand upon that equity as a focus and make those cultural investments in the right areas, you know, we have to not forget where we came from at all. Uh, we did a big program about a year ago with the African American Art and Culture Complex in San Francisco, and that was keeping the historical value of that building that they were housed in alive, right? And was bringing more community involvement. Um, so I think social media is, is a great way to amplify those stories, you know, to promote the history and the legacy of those historical places. I also think that youth engagement is super, super important right now. You know, I think it was Chip and Deborah and Michael and even Jeremy and Shark have said that the youth are, that we are witnessing a different, um, you know, uh, nature of the beast, if you will, um, if I can use that, you know, um, in not a degrading way, but the youth are in the community and they're involved in arts and they want to be able to take the baton and run with it and kind of lead and charge forward with creative ideas in the way that we've never seen before. And I'm also really passionate about connecting the youth and those organizations with, um, with, with the aging community as well, right? So when I grew up, we were paired up with, um, you know, neurological institutes, for example, in the small, the small town of Kansas. And that put us in direct proximity with folks that were challenged, but it created this productive scale for us, this framing that really allowed for us to be together, 
and foster creativity and promote interaction. So I would love to see more of that um, so that uh, the youth stay involved and, you know, the aging population is not, not forgotten, gotten about, but, you know, let's, again, not forget the funding. That's, that's, uh, ultimately the, the, the big charge here. You know, um, we're, we're all some of artists, a lot, we're all community members. Does anyone else have, you know, thoughts of, you know, ways that arts organizations can re-energize the way they're touching communities because, you know, that it, it it is a tired, it's, it may seem like a tired old question, but it really hasn't been done in many places. No. This is Deborah. I think that um, first arts organizations need to understand the communities they're in and what the challenges are, what their needs are and how they can relate to that and um, bring forth information back to the organization that they can use in their programming and in their outreach and in their decisions about how they um, hire and how they decide what they're going to be showing the community and the organization. I would agree with that, Deborah. Um, you know, what drives people to art, what connects people to art is different across society and across cultures. So you're right, getting to know who it is you want to be in community with. What do they value? What, what, uh, what stories do they have? What ways do they, they want to interact with you as, as an organization? What, what, are their, what are their priorities? What are their community priorities? How can you be an instrument in that? Um, these are all good questions about connecting authentically to our communities and and making space. Um, because what I, the other thing is, and we have to net, we have to name this. It's one thing to invite them, but once they get there, are they welcome? Is there a sense of belonging? Is there a sense of place? Or are there are there a myriad of structures that actually make that experience less than positive? Microaggressions and, and systems that put them, that marginalize them in ways that are unknown and unseen and unnamed. So uh, we have a lot of work to do, both connecting to them and creating a place that they feel they are, they, they feel safe in and that they feel connected to once they arrive. Can, can I have one other thing, which is that, um, Arts organizations, uh, especially the bigger ones, tend to work with a lot of runway. We plan really far in advance, and and we do that in an effort to secure what what we perceive as the best um, and to um, to bring excellence into the community. But where that backfires on us is that we are unable in the moment. To, uh, to respond to the zeitgeist. Um, so uh, I haven't been able to figure this one out, but um, we, need, we need a mechanism in which we're able to respond quickly and, and meaningfully and um, put something together on the fly that really reflects what we are hearing from the public. One of the things that I always I think about is that when everyone wants to connect with the community, they have they have one they have a uh, they blinders on that there's one type of black person, one type of you know uh, one type of woman, you know. But they, we're never trying to connect with the whole or with with we're not trying to understand each person. And there needs to be some more talks about how to connect in that way. Um, and, and there are some people in the community who want to help the unfortunate. How can we, that person, be involved in that change through the arts community? Um, and that's where you, you get amazing donors. You get amazing board members who want to be a part of that change. But I don't think those conversations are always happening. Um, that's just my, my two cents on that. Um, you know, going towards um, the board, I want to start with uh, Deborah Gold. Um, you know, as a board member who you have an extensive track record in DEI work in medicine, um, from that, what steps can arts organizations make towards meaningful progress 
in DEI? Well, first we have to understand what we're talking about. And I, so I want to define what I mean by that so we're all speaking the same language. Diversity includes all the ways in which people differ. And often we only hear about it in relation to race or gender or, or ethnicity, but it's much broader than that. And really the scope includes many aspects of who a person is, where they're from, this generation, where, how they were raised, their abilities, perspectives, and, uh, and values. And we have to include that as far as when we have that conversation. Equity is fair treatment, access, opportunity, and advancement for all people while looking to identify what and eliminate with the barriers that prevent the full participation of all the groups in the first place and created the outcome disparities that we see. It's not equality. Equality is one size fits all. Everyone is treated the same regardless of and ignoring their needs. Equity is a principle that's really based upon justness and fairness where attention is paid to the individual needs and requirements. Inclusion, it's the act of creating that environment in which any individual can be and feel welcomed, respected, supported, and valued to fully participate, to have a seat at the table in the room where it happened. So why should any organization embark upon the journey of culture change to be diverse, equitable, and inclusive? Well, understand this is not an HR initiative. It's a strategic initiative that should be reflected in the organization's mission and vision and values and be incorporated into strategic plans and operations. So if we look at it from different perspectives, from a moral or social justice perspective, nonprofit organizations are created to improve society. And so as such, they really should be diverse. They should be inclusive. They should be equitable. From an economic perspective, organizations you know, when they tap into diverse talent, they are stronger and more efficient. You know, economists look at discrimination as economic inefficiency because really you're misallocating human resources. And in one study, it showed that it costs businesses $64 billion a year because we're not paying attention to that. From a marketing perspective, you could better serve your, your customers and expand your customer base if you reflect the diversity and address the needs of your market. Donors are customers, take a purchasers are customers. They want to see themselves represented in the organization, in the programming, in the structure, and in the staff. They want to see their needs addressed. And for example, to counter the lack of um, arts funding in public schools, the Berkeley Symphony's music in the schools program in partnership with the Berkeley Unified School District, provides a comprehensive age-appropriate music curriculum in the Berkeley public elementary and middle school students they wouldn't get otherwise. The Chicago Symphony Orchestra engaged the large Latino community by forming the CSO Latino Alliance, which connected the, the Chicago Symphony with Chicago's Latino community and created awareness, sharing insights, building relationships, and brought in new patrons. From a changing demographic perspective, as the National Endowment for the Arts has stated, changes in the U.S. demographic composition really has impacted negatively um, the performing arts attendance. You know, if we know that by 2042, people of color will become the majority population in the U.S. and will make up 54% of the U.S. population by 2050, arts and culture organizations need to attract more diverse audiences, donors, employees, board members, and other key stakeholders if they want to achieve and maintain programmatic and financial and operational success. On a governance level, boards should examine their own makeup and determine whose voice is missing from the decision-making table. Because when those voices are missing, opportunities are lost and bad decisions are made. For example, when Chevrolet decided to build an automobile plant in Mexico to build the Nova, no one was at the table to tell them that Nova means don't go. During my career, you know, I've taught leadership to physicians. And one principle of the core of being a successful leader is leadership equals vision plus task plus relationship with an emphasis and a focus on relationship. Audiences, you know, they connect to organizations through the programming. So it's important that designers of content and engagement strategies develop a relationship with and understand the needs of the communities they serve. 
Has your board of directors discussed how inequalities in the community or unequal access to the resources in the community impact your mission? Does your organization create opportunities to listen to the voices directly from community grassroots or leaders of underserved or marginalized populations in your community? Are you ready? DEI work moving from being wake to woke to work is a journey, not a trip. To be successful, you have to be fully invested and have a good idea of what's involved. Leaders who aren't invested can really become obstacles to change and keep your organization from moving beyond the status quo. For those of you who have ever read the book, Who Moved My Cheese? There's a phrase in there, if you do not change, you become extinct. So invest in, communi in communication and relationship building uh, with your team, your community, your donors, and other stakeholders, and be ready for a long-term commitment for doing the work because a one-time event, a workshop, or passing of a handbook is just not sufficient to getting the work done. Your leaders, and you have to recognize you have formal and you have informal leaders, have to have this work as part of their job and not delegated to uh, a person of color to carry the ball. And you have to understand this work can be discomforting, but recognize that if we recognize that discomfort, we can learn from it. One, um, one diversity training I went to said D plus D equals D. Differences plus discomfort equals discovery. If you're willing to work through the ups and downs and working through the rough spots, you can learn from it. And then you have to also pay attention to who your team is. Is it functional, willing to learn and grow? Because you're going to uncover some larger challenges in leadership and function that you may not have recognized were there. There needs to be room for healthy dialogue because this is a human process with human interactions and can be difficult and messy. You have to be willing to examine and address your larger ingrown systemic issues in your organization that need trans, you know, to be transformed in your operations, your policies, your practices, and your communications. And you need to make sure that the people you delegate have the energy and passion for this work, and you have a structure to oversee it and manage it, and that you've looked at and done a gap analysis. Where are you now? Where do you want to be? get data and analyze it to determine, is this gap valid? Where do you want to start your work and how you're going to continue it? And what measures of success you're going to use to determine that you've done good and that you can stay that way. And finally, you have to be, be, you know, be prepared to acknowledge and address isms, power, and privileged dynamics that exist in every organization, but they're not discussed but they do service during the process of DEI work. Listening with humility, acknowledging these dynamics, and working to transform them builds trust and a culture where everyone feels valued and, ability, and able to fully contribute to the cause. One thing about privilege though, often people are unaware that they have it and they are unaware of the impact of the privileged actions, what that impact is on others. Privilege comes with unequal access to power and resources, and DEI work gives us an opportunity to reflect on our own privilege and use it to make a difference. So for success in creating an equitable, diverse, inclusive environment, leaders have to have courage. They have to be transparent along every step of the journey and have to be willing to invest time and resources to this endeavor. Because remember, if you don't change, you can become extinct. Thank you so much, Deborah. You know, I'm going to remember the the DDD perspective because I hope everyone is a little, I think, disturbed right now. I hope everyone's a little disruptive right now so we can start seeing that change. Um, before I go uh, to our last question, I want to make sure that you, everyone, you're able to ask questions in the, the Q&A uh, portion of zoom or the chat function in uh on youtube so you can leave questions there um and then i want to ask shark the almost almost the same question you have extensive record of dei work in various industries and so what do you think steps um, arts organizations can make um, towards meaningful process uh, progress in dei 
So Deborah really set the stage with her definition of uh, diversity, inclusion, equity, and access. Um, I uh, like to think of diversity as make, counting every head and inclusion as making sure every head counts. And uh, that's kind of the overarching, all the simple philosophy. And what arts organizations can do is learn from business because the diversity, equity, and inclusion movement, if you want to call it that, actually started in industry in the 1990s. And the reason they did that is the data are incontrovertible, regardless of how you measure success. And businesses, you measure success on return on capital employed, return on shareholder equity, earnings per barrel, safety, however it is that you measure uh, success in your organization. Diverse and inclusive organizations have a 62% multiplier effect on uh, the business performance. And uh, we have done some work uh, on whether or not this premise applies to arts organizations. And it in fact is an existential threat. If we don't diversify our boards, if we don't appeal to a broader audience, if we don't make it welcoming, we are headed for extinction. So this is not a nice to have, it's not just a moral imperative, it is absolutely necessary if we are not only to survive, but to thrive. So in looking back at 20 years of diversity and inclusion uh, initiatives, it has become very clear that, in, and Chip talked about, you must have money. And yes, you must fund these. But literally hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on DEI initiatives, and we have very little to show for it. And the reason is that many organizations have not moved beyond the totemic or symbolic, just statements of solidarity and there's nothing to support it. Uh, employee resource groups that are not connected to business strategies, uh, organizations that are diversity action councils or diversity councils that have no authority, no responsibility, things are not integrated into the mission of the organization. And what we have found is organizations that are successful, not only are metrics driven because you treasure what you measure, but data is useless unless it leads to insights, but insights are useless unless they lead to action. So clear accountability. So having the same rigor that you would in articulating a business strategy or an operational strategy is extremely important because this is a strategic imperative. And the way you do that, and this is really a result of 20 years of research, is that you intertwine diversity and inclusion into the very fabric of your organization, the DNA, the values. So what are the values of the organization? Is diversity and inclusion one of the foundational values of the organization? And if so, how do you blend it into everything you do? So organizations that are very successful create an ecosystem where all the organization, the process, the methodologies, uh, how we comport ourselves uh, systemically, uh, all are integrated into this vision of who we aspire to be. And in fact, if you do not adhere to these values, then maybe you belong somewhere else. So that is how strong uh, organizations really move the needle. So it's, Symbols are extremely important, but you must have the same rigor and strategies that you do in business uh, in DNI. And of course, you know, in any strategy, you have to have a market plan, a product plan, a people plan, and finally a financial plan. So approaching this from that perspective is a lesson learned that arts organizations can take on board from business. Thank you for that. Um, so I, th I think we have one or two questions. Um, one of the questions that's coming in is, how does one spark curiosity amongst those who may not, may not want it or may not know yet that they want it? How does one lead the horse to water and make or help them drink? Um, I, I, don't, I don't want to, to to um, take away from you, everyone answering the question, but um, I just wanna propose that maybe they don't want water. 
you know, or maybe you haven't asked what they're curious about. I think there's that open dialogue that we've never, we, we tend to have one-sided uh, conversations in arts organizations and, you know, maybe we need to figure out what someone is curious about. Um, that's, that's, the, that's where I would first take that question to. Anyone else have any thoughts on that? I, I do, um, uh, which is that this is going to be a problem that we're going to encounter for, for a long time, um, that it, as uh, basic education, uh, arts education uh, is undervalued within our educational system, um, there are fewer people who are approaching uh, uh, the performing arts with uh, the same level of awareness that, that many of us uh, came to them with. So I think creating um, a, a narrative that, uh, that, is, that is powerful, that, um, that introduces a work, um, that in introduces a, a concept uh, um, as an experience, rather than relying on the work itself, uh, the, the work to speak for its, itself, assuming that people recognize the artists involved and, and, and the composer, or, uh, is, it has become a necessity that we have to be able to tell the, sto uh, the story that is behind the art. Um, and uh, of, co of course, that's subjective. Um, what, the, the story that I, I take away, it could be very different than the story the person sitting at the performance next to me could take away but it is a place to start. I would comment that by reaching and figuring out what commonality you have with the person who doesn't want to go to the water or drink, um, you, got to, you got to reach people where they, where they are. And through commonality, there's something we all have in common. If you find that, it can lead to a dialogue and ability to be able to have a conversation about a different perspective. Yeah, that's a good question, Joseph. And if I could uh, add a, a little bit of context there as well. You know, what I've seen is that, it, you know, growing up and working in, um, you know, corporate white America, uh, you often are exposed to a lot of elements of that, right? And so you see structurally how those organizations operate and how they build and how they build teams and how they go to market and kind of what their key performance indicators are that not only keep the lights on, but allow for them to, those companies to be successful. I think that has to funnel back down to, um, you know, many social and civic and, and cultural functions when it comes to music and arts as well. And, and I've seen corporations, you know, get too professionalized, you know, if I could use that word. And that structure basically gets in the way and it actually ex excludes participation in areas uh, for ordinary people like, like myself, just trying to do something on one end of the spectrum that's meaningful and lasting and creative and um, balances out what I do on a daily basis, nine to five. So, you know, we often have to uh, get out of our own way or at least take the professional aspect of that, all of the structure that's in the way so that creative can kind of come to bear and come to fruition, right? Um, and keeping that in mind, I think helps connect people a little bit, a little bit better. And, and I, I, when you say that, I think, I mean, I don't know if Michael, you, if you uh, want to add anything, I think of how you just change, sometimes even change the concept of what a concert is sometimes for, to meet people halfway. Well, I was about to say, it's, it, a lot of it is, in fact, <clears throat> figuring out where people are. And because uh, what we do in the various performing arts, all, all of them, whether they are European or American or whatever, the, the, the experiences are universal. And so figuring out what the connection is between that and where people actually are. Tell a quick story is I was running an opera company a while back. And we were bringing these kids from East Oakland, it was during the summer, bringing these kids from East Oakland to an opera rehearsal. Now, opera companies generally, and, and, and Chip, you don't, don't worry anything I say now about opera companies, but opera companies will bring a bunch of kids to see, to see the marriage of Figaro because the music is charming or the, or the Barber of Seville because the music is charming. When in fact, unless you have a certain sort of knowledge level and, low, and knowledge of 
class systems and all those things, you don't even, many of us who even do the pieces don't remember why they were ever supposed to be funny. And so you bring a bunch of children to this and they make no connection. Well, we brought these children kicking and screaming from East Oakland to, because they didn't want to go to an opera rehearsal. We brought them out to see a, an, uh, to see a rehearsal of Werther, of Massenet, Werther. And basically Werther, you know, the, uh, the tenor is in love with the mezzo and, find, and at, the end of, at the end of the thing kills himself over the mezzo because she's already married. That is something they can all wrap their heads around. And we brought them out for, and we had a cast that looked like the part. They were young and very, they looked like their roles. But we brought them out. We were planning to have them there for just half a rehearsal. We got them to the, they got to the break and nobody wanted to leave. And then they, and then a bunch of them wanted to come back and see a full performance. And at the moment, and the teachers were telling me, the ones that came back, at the moment when Verter shoots himself, the kids actually sort of grabbed teachers and went, oh my God, because it was, it, it met them where they were in terms of something they could wrap their heads around. And it's, cause it's, not, it's not a complicated story. It's glorious music and we all think it's a, a masterpiece, but you could wrap your head around the story and you could connect to it. And so don't take, so the bottom line is don't take children to see the Barber of Seville. They, they won't get it. Well, I, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna gently and lovingly extend your thinking <laughs> by saying, <laughs> by saying, a lot of my uh, uh, colleagues uh, do, in fact, forget to do the due diligence when it comes to connecting youth with art, no matter what kind of art it is. Access is not enough. Exactly. Giving them a ticket, let's send ten thousand children to the to the opera. That's not enough. You've got to make it relevant. You've got to make it meaningful. You've got to create all kinds of ways in which that art. Is matters to them in their lives and in some way, shape, or form makes it meaningful for them to have gone. But uh, so having said that, I just want to say something about the, the horse and the water. Uh, and I'm just going to say this. I'm just going to, I feel actually, I feel very cathartic. I feel like I can get this off my chest once and for all. You know, um, I just want to have, a, I have a lot of empathy for my, again, my white brothers and sisters whose minds, who do not recognize the strength and the power of white supremacy and its ability to make sure that you never recognize your whiteness. That system is amazing. Oh my gosh, it has done a great job. And so the fact that it's gonna take more work and more time for you to find a new way of seeing things is not, is not a bad thing. But I'm gonna say this though, my contemporaries, my, my, my colleagues in this business, um, when you say, and I'm going to quote something somebody wrote on Facebook, I promised I would answer this. Systemic racism is a false narrative. Now, if you're not going to do any reading whatsoever, and you're not going to do, you're not going to meet me halfway by at least doing your homework, and you're going to put forth a comment like systemic racism is a false narrative, that tells me you've, you've read nothing, that you haven't even begun to be willing to see things differently, and that you're not coming at this halfway. We don't have a lot of time for that anymore. We're tired of that. That's that's too we got that's too far back. Come on, at least read a couple of books. You re, read some of the contemporary dialogue, whether the academic, social, literary, journalistic. I don't care, but at least come to the conversation where we can have a dialogue that's really going to tease out some new understandings and insight. But don't tell me. Don't just give me a, a statement like racism is a is a figment of my imagination. I'm so sorry. I'm not going to accept that, nor will I engage with you. Chip, I'm going to let that be the closing statement. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's such an impassioned uh, uh, um, a message for everyone to take with them. I think, and I hope everyone took notes to take back with them to their own organizations. For me, I, I am so happy that I can be a part of this conversation with all of you. Um, we call you thought leaders. You are, to me, uh, all of you, to me, are mentors um, in, in my head. Um, but I want to thank you all for joining me. Um, I also want to thank the Commonwealth Club. Um, 
you donated so much of your time and resources to this event. And we at the Berkeley Symphony can't thank you enough for helping us put this together. As a parting message, I want to share a bit of music for, from a Bay Area um, organization, the Oakland Interfaith Community Choir released mm. a video that really touched me and I thought it would be a great ending to this town hall. As a message of standing together and Black Lives Matters, the, the choir published this video called Hear My Prayer. As we all reflect on the tragic events in our future, even as we can't come together as artists, we still sing. So thank you all for joining me for this evening's uh, Reflection Town Hall. Joe!